Oh, good to see you folks here this morning. This is Christ the King Sunday. We've been celebrating this for about 20 years now. Uh, you may not know the story behind Christ the King, but it's not an ancient church tradition. Pope Pius XI started it in 1925, and uh, it was because he saw nationalism and isolation in Europe and in America after World War I. And he became worried with the rise of communism and fascism, and he thought that lifting up Christ as our king would remind people where their true loyalties lie. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But Christ the King Sunday was originally put at the last Sunday of October. And you Protestants may recognize a problem there. No Protestants were celebrating Christ the King Sunday. We were busy celebrating Reformation Sunday. And in 1969, Pope Paul VI changed the date to the last Sunday in the church year. We now see Christ the King Sunday as the close of the church year, and Protestants have slowly gotten on board. Lutherans came on board in the 1990s. But so, if you don't remember your grandmother celebrating this as a small child, you're, you're not wrong. It is the end of the church year. We have completed the journey from Advent through Christmas, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, and then that long six months of no holidays, no holy days, called ordinary time. And this is the last Sunday in the church year. Next week, when Pastor Jerry will be here, we will begin a new church year with Advent. We're also ending another journey today, and that's the journey through the book of Acts. We began that journey back in Pentecost. And I'll talk more about that in the sermon, but know that that journey too is coming to an end today. And the last thing I want to tell you is that the journey through the rotating pastors uh, coming every week, uh, that ends today because next week, Pastor Jerry Pennington will be joining us as our interim and he will be with us for the foreseeable future as he not only steps us through the grieving and healing process as a congregation, but also gets us ready for the call process and all of the work that has to be done over the next many months. So be sure to be here next Sunday early before church because there will be a, a brief reception to greet Pastor Jerry uh, and then get to hear his first sermon uh, here at Christ Lutheran. Okay, with that said, I believe it's time for our gathering words. Please rise if you're able. Come, Holy Spirit, come and fill us in this place. When the world is divided, when we feel uncertain, When the world turns from you, when we feel afraid and hopeless, come Holy Spirit, give us faith. And now at this time we will join together as a community and share the words of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again, judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. At this time, we will have our opening song. Baptism, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church. Turn our lives towards you in repentance, Lord. Turn our hearts towards our neighbors in love. Turn our actions towards the world in mercy. Renew us in faith, in prayer, and in compassion. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the world. Teach us to treasure the earth as your beloved creation. Provide plentiful and healthful homes for all creatures. Bring new life from decay. Repair what has been damaged from misuse or neglect. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the nations. Empower leaders to resist the use of power for personal gain or selfish interest. Teach us to build communities where all can live in safety and peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in need. Protect those who are victimized by crime or injustice. Unburden those who are weighed down by guilt or shame. Assist those who are unemployed. Comfort those who mourn and heal the sick, especially as we name them aloud or in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this assembly. Deepen our faith. Empower those who work in our community provide food, shelter, and health care for those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy. With thanksgiving, we remember all who have died in faith. Bring us with them to the promise of unending life with you. Lord, in your mercy. Trusting in your covenant of mercy, O God, we lift our prayers to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And let all of God's people say, You may be seated.
Our reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here ends the reading. Paul wrote those words while he sat chained to a Roman soldier for more than two years. He was awaiting the judgment of Caesar. For more than two years before that, he was a prisoner in the Roman barracks in Caesarea, the seaside palace of the Romans in Judea. The Roman governor of Judea, Felix, held Paul prisoner partly for his safety, because Paul's Jewish enemies in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, had sworn an oath to kill him. But Felix and his successor as governor, Festus, could find no crime to charge Paul with under Roman law. And so they were about to send Paul back to the Sanhedrin, back to his enemies. And Paul suddenly demanded his right to have his case heard before Caesar. And so Paul and his Roman captors made the dangerous sea voyage from Palestine to Rome. During the stormy season, the fall, when the Mediterranean was very dangerous for shipping. As Paul predicted, being an old expert at over 10,000 miles of walking and ship rides, and over three shipwrecks before this time, Paul predicted we're going to have a shipwreck. And sure enough, off the island of Malta, the ship ran aground, but all were saved and all made it to the island of Malta. And from there, eventually, they were taken to Rome. The story in this last two chapters of the book of Acts concludes Luke's history of the early church. Here's how Luke ends the book. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So today we mark the conclusion of the journey that Pastor Mark led us on beginning with his Pentecost sermon. That was in late May. Mark wanted to go through the entire book of Acts so that we could learn our history the events and the heroes of our faith described by Luke in part of his two-volume work. The first volume was Luke's gospel, telling the story of Jesus of Nazareth, a Galilean rabbi who preached the coming of the kingdom of God and taught his followers how to live in that kingdom now. And then the book of Acts, Luke's telling of the coming of the Holy Spirit and how that Spirit moved followers like Stephen and Philip and Peter and Paul to go out 
and preach the good news. First in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Syria, finally all the way to the heart of the empire, Rome. In late September, following Pastor Mark's tragic death, Bishop Mike determined that we should finish this work that Pastor Mark had begun. And for this, here at the end of the book, the bishop asked one question. What happened to Paul? And the answer for 2,000 years is we don't know. Luke wasn't telling the life story of Peter and Paul. He was telling of the Holy Spirit breaking out into the world. And that story didn't end with Paul. That story continued to expand as dozens of followers of Jesus became hundreds and then thousands. And so that today, there are over two and a half billion Christians. Almost a third of the human race follows Jesus Christ. And we here at Christ Lutheran, this fellowship, we're a part of that growth of the Holy Spirit. But being human, we naturally want to know what happened to Paul. And the early church had two different but conflicting stories about that. Some of the early church fathers wrote that Paul was exonerated at his trial by Caesar, and he was released. And then just as he had promised in his letter to the Romans, he went west. He had a fourth missionary trip, and he went to Spain. Many people believe that this is what happened to Paul. But we have no letters from Paul to any of the congregations that he might have founded in Spain. And there's no other evidence in Scripture that he made such a trip. The second tradition, just as ancient and attested by other early church fathers, is that Nero, the Caesar of Paul's day, a narcissistic megalomaniac who had no love for Christians, that Nero condemned Paul and that he was led out onto the Appian Way, the road that Paul had traveled coming into Rome. And there he was executed by the kinder and gentler way allotted to Roman citizens. He was beheaded. And to this day, the church marks the spot on that road where Paul, the great apostle, gave up his life so that he could be with Christ. Now, why would Nero condemn Paul when the Roman officials back in Judea could find no crime of Roman law to charge Paul with? Maybe that reading we had from Philippians, written while Paul was a prisoner in Rome, probably it's the most joyful letter in the whole New Testament. Maybe that letter gives us a clue. Listen to Paul's words from 2,000 years ago, also from Philippians. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel, so that it has become known through the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. The imperial guard, the praetorians, the actual bodyguards of Nero were listening to Paul. And they were responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. At the end of this letter, Paul closes. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. Can you see Paul, uh, Nero? when he learns that this elderly Jewish rabbi who has been under house arrest for two years 
has been gradually making Jesus' followers out of his guards, out of the soldiers that were chained to him night and day in six-hour shifts. And he, he wasn't just getting them to put their faith in an additional new God. No, Paul preached Christ and him crucified. That's what he told the Corinthians, that it was a stumbling block to the Jews and it was foolishness to the Gentiles. Even worse, Paul called Jesus the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And those two titles were reserved for Caesar. They were exclusively reserved for Caesar. On Roman coins, many of them bear not only Caesar's image, but the words, Son of God. And on monuments throughout the empire, engraved on the monuments would be words that said, Caesar is the savior of the world. The Caesars even built temples to themselves so that you could go and worship. And this old Jewish tent maker dares to claim those royal titles for a Galilean peasant that Rome crucified 30 years earlier? At the name of Jesus, not Caesar, every knee would bend, and every tongue would confess that Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. Rome promised the people that they conquered that Caesar would bring them peace and prosperity. As long as you paid your Roman taxes and whatever else the empire might want to take from you. So when Nero looks at Paul, he doesn't see just a harmless street corner preacher pushing just one more new superstition. No, Nero sees the end of the Roman Empire if these people aren't stopped. So Nero executes Paul, and he crucifies Peter, and he kills hundreds of Christians in Rome, blaming them for the great fire that consumed large parts of the city that just happened to make room for Nero's new golden house, the palace he had been wanting to build. Kings, dictators, demagogues, they always promise peace and security, and yet they always fail. Still, Many people put their trust in them. Jesus shows us a different way. Jesus is a different kind of king. And ultimately, his followers believe he is the only true king. So each of us has to decide who is our king, Caesar or Jesus, the power and wealth of this world, or God's promises in Jesus? Where do you place your faith? Where do you find your hope? In wealth? Is your security tied to your bank account? In political power? Is having the largest army or the most nuclear weapons, what brings us peace and lets us sleep at night? Paul wrote these words to the Philippians. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Over 3,000 years ago, the people of Israel are faced with this same challenge. Joshua chapter 24. 
But if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors across the region beyond the river or the gods of the people in whose land you dwell now. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We always serve somebody, the world or Jesus. Who will you serve? Amen.